Hello and welcome to another short tutorial, this one on different types of backhaul for mobile communications. What exactly is backhaul? So if we look at simplified network architecture, we can see that it can be split into radio access network, core network and air interface. The link between the radio access network and the core network is referred to as backhaul. Traditionally in GSM networks, these backhaul links were generally E1 and T1 links. They were very low data rate links. E1 link was 2 Mbps and T1 was 1.5 Mbps. Now, because GSM was designed mainly for voice, and of course later on data was added with GPRS, but data rates were still quite low. So these links used to work for the 2 and 2.5G network. If one needed higher data rates, multiple links could be added to increase the data rates. And this could work in the 2G era. But now with 3G and beyond and 5G coming, we need much higher data rate support from the backhaul. So things need to change. So we are going to be looking at many different types of backhaul. This is just an overview. There are many more backhaul types and other subcategories that we will not be exploring in this particular video. So let's start with wired. Within the wired, the most popular backhaul is the fiber backhaul. This is mainly in 4G, where there was a need for higher and higher data rates support in the backhaul, so optical fiber was needed. So 80% of all the 4G sites and the 5G sites of the future that will exist in dense urban areas will need optical fiber in either the first leg or somewhere in the backhaul chain. We also have the copper cables, which are still being used, especially in the 3G networks. So we have the coaxial cable, that gives good data rates. Even in some small cell deployments, we can use coaxial cables to give reasonable data rates. And of course, we can have Ethernet cables, whether career or consumer Ethernet, which is used in the small cell backhaul, as long as it provides reasonable data rates. I recently came across this advert from Virgin Media in the UK. Now, Virgin have rolled out DOCSIS 3 in their cable network. And they are saying with DOCSIS 3 copper cable, you can get up to 152 Mbps connectivity, which is quite good. However, this may work with small cells in 4G, but when we move to 5G, we will probably require fiber for much higher data rate support. I came across this slide from Ericsson recently. According to these stats, 20% of the sites in advanced networks will need 3 to 5 Gbps capacity by 2025, but 80% of the sites will need less than one Gbps. So again, fiber is great, but not the only option. We also have to look at microwave backhaul technologies that can provide good data rates. So let's first look at some concepts. When the transmitter and receiver, especially for wireless, have a direct line of sight, that's just referred to as an LOS connection. We can also have non-line of sight. Non-line of sight may receive the signal from the transmitter which penetrates through buildings. This works better with lower frequencies as they are better at penetrating through walls. Then there are reflections. Here the receiver is receiving reflections from the transmitter. This could be one or two reflections, it depends. Thirdly, there is diffraction. This is where the signal from the transmitter gets diffracted and is received by the receiver. Now, there is also a differentiation between the non line of sight and near line of sight. So, as you can see, the non and near are differentiated by a capital and small n. Non line of sight is penetration, and near line of sight covers reflection and diffraction. Then we have point to point where there is one transmitter and one receiver. Or point to multipoint, where there is one transmitter and multiple receivers. Both have advantages and disadvantages. Ideally, when a lot of small cells are being deployed in a dense urban area, one transmitter and multiple small cell receivers would be preferable to achieve point to multipoint reception. Whereas if there is a capacity bottleneck, point to point transmission would be preferable. Depends on the type of deployment going on. Regarding microwave frequencies, microwave plays a big role in backhaul. 
especially away from urban centres, whether rural or suburban, it can be difficult to have cables go across difficult terrain. Micro frequencies are more preferable and practical. So there is the traditional 10 to 42 gigahertz microwave link. Then there is the V-band, which is the 57 to 64 gigahertz frequency, but they are generally referred to as the 60 gigahertz band. There is also the E-band, 71 to 76, 81 to 86 gigahertz band. The names that you see at the bottom of this diagram are the ITU names. They are different from the 3GPP band names. Where you have the band 1, 2, 3, the ITU names are the E band, K band, KU band, and V band. However, there is a problem with these bands. These bands have traditionally been used for microwave backhaul, but as you know, 5G is just around the corner. In 5G, multiple layers are needed for providing really good 5G coverage. So the coverage layer would be sub 1 or sub 2 gigahertz depending on whom you ask. Then the capacity layer between one and six gigahertz to provide the capacity, but the high throughput layer is also needed from six to 100 gigahertz. These are the bands that are being studied for 5G. So these bands were approved in the World Radio Conference, WRC 15, and they will be reviewed and approved in WRC 19 held by ITU. So you can see a lot of bands that would have traditionally been available for backhaul and other purposes are being studied for 5G. There is a good chance that quite a few of these bands, because they are harmonized across various geographic areas, will be used for 5G. So some of these bands saved previously for microwave may not be available for backhaul later on. This is why in Etsy work is going on to study bands above 90 gigahertz. Two of these bands being studied very thoroughly are the W band, which goes from 92 to 114.5 gigahertz, and the D band, which goes from 130 to 174.5 gigahertz. These are very high frequencies, and five years ago, no one was even thinking of using these bands for any sort of communication. Technolo technology simply wasn't advanced enough, but now because of Moore's law and all the other technological advancement, it is possible to study these bands, and quite possibly in another five years, these bands could be used commercially for backhaul and other applications. So coming back to the microwave frequencies, the microwave band 10 to 42 gigahertz is used extensively for backhaul, the U band 57 to 64 and the E band. Now the V band has another challenge. So 60 gigahertz is the ISM band, which is unlicensed and is used for Y gig. So we can see not all bands are aligned across geographic areas, but there are common frequencies and there are frequencies only available in certain areas. But the 7 gigahertz band is a wide band and available across the globe. But because it's 60 gigahertz, we have oxygen absorption. So transmission distances are very low, less than one kilometer. This frequency has been used for a while with Y gig and does not cost a lot. So we see the economy of scale. But because it's unlicensed, there are more chances of interference from known and unknown areas. Another area is satellite backhaul, especially in rural and remote locations. A satellite backhaul is needed because traditional backhauls cannot reach such areas. So satellite backhaul works very well with 2G and 3G and reasonably well with 4G. Some optimization is needed to get rid of headers for 4G, especially with, to work with Volti, but it does work. But with 5G, there might be some struggle unless we set low Earth orbit or LEO satellites. This chart looks at different types of backhaul, the traditional microwave, satellite, fixed fiber and copper backhauls. Please study at your own leisure. I just wanted to make a few points. When we talk about traditional microwave E-band here, the chart says future proof available bandwidth. However, with 5G on the horizon, that may not necessarily be true. For the V-band, it says interference immunity, but again, with YGIG being available, 60 gigahertz being unlicensed, there might be a lot of interference from known and unknown sources. Finally, the chart says that satellite deployment costs are high. But these costs are going down significantly with the launch of HTS or high throughput satellites. Also, because there is a lot of bandwidth available, the cost per bit of satellite backhaul has also decreased but it has to decrease even further to be used more widely. 
Another kind of backhaul is the LTE backhaul. Here is an example of in-band backhaul, where the microcell is transmitting on frequency F1. The small cell receives this F1 and transmits as F12, basically extending the coverage area. What we need to bear in mind is the small cell has to have a directional antenna, so it transmits at an area that does not interfere with the macro cell. Because if it transmits in an omnidirectional way everywhere, the transmission from the macro cell to small cell will interfere with each other and the small cell may not be usable at all. Another approach is of course out of bound band where the macro cell is transmitting at one frequency and the small cell is transmitting at another frequency. So this way there is no interference between the macro cell and the small cell. Now you can use this approach to extend coverage with a Wi-Fi mesh. Here we have one small cell at the edge of the macro cell transmitting out of band on frequency F2. But the other small cell, because it's outside the range of the macro, it could actually be transmitting at both F1 and F2. And small cell 1 and small cell 2 are connected by the point to point 5 gigahertz Wi-Fi mesh link. And this concept can be expanded to connect multiple small cells to increase the coverage area with this kind of connectivity. Generally, the latency for this kind of Wi-Fi mesh link is very low. It's like one to two milliseconds, so not much of an issue. And also, these links do not have to be point to point links. They can be multi point links, so redundancies can be created. If one small cell goes down, others can take over, so connectivity can be maintained via other links. Another approach that has been trialled and demoed by Ericsson and Iptree in Taiwan is the TD-LTE backhaul. Here, if a big chunk of TD-LTE band is available, you can actually backhaul onto TD-LTE. For example, a small cell can be placed on a train that uses FTD. So the backhaul is on the link, which is not a commonly used frequency, but it has a wide bandwidth. And the FTD small cell inside is on a widely used frequency. This way, the coverage can be improved for passengers on the train. They don't have to keep handing over to different macro cells outside, thereby optimizing their power consumptions and their user experience. In 5G, there is another concept of self-backhauling in a way that is very similar to in-band backhauling, which we saw in LTE. Because in 5G, we will have dense deployment, so we cannot have fiber connecting each and every base station. So we might have fiber connecting one base station, but then that one base station will be connected to three or four base stations via self backhauling. So the other base stations backhaul onto each other and one connect to the main base station via fiber. This is a good concept, but the main challenge would be managing interference. One final option I wanted to discuss was the optical or laser backhaul. I've seen some demos for laser backhaul. I found them very reasonable, but they are expensive. Instead of microwave, this has to be point to point connectivity and line of sight. Because this is laser, it, cannot be, it can be affected by conditions such as fog and wind. It can give high throughput rates, but again, expense is an issue. So there are pros and cons. For example, here is a hybrid laser and millimeter spectrum wave setup. So when there is severe fog and wind conditions, if there, is a, if there is blockage and no line of sight, then the laser beam is not functioning, then they can transmit on millimeter wave. So there is some kind of redundancy. Some of you may be aware that Facebook is working on a drone called Aquila. This drone has a similar concept. So when the drones need to communicate with each other, they use laser backhaul. When they connect to the earth station, they also use laser. But of course, when drones transmit to users, they transmit through radio signals as there is no other option. I hope you enjoyed this tutorial on different types of backhaul. I hope you found it useful. Any comments or feedback are of course much appreciated. Many thanks.